Hello Cardinals and welcome to today's reading of Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake. This is chapter 12. Please crawl. Snowman limps along the rampart towards the glassy white swell of the bubble dome, which is receding from him like a mirage. Because of his foot, he's making poor time, and around 11 o'clock, the concrete gets too hot for him to walk on. He's got the sheet over his head, draped um, himself as much as possible, over his baseball cap and over the tropical shirt, but he could still burn, despite the sunblock and the two layers of cloth. He's grateful for his new two-eyed sunglasses. He hunches down in the shade of the next watchtower to wait out the noon, sucks water from a bottle. After the worst of the glare of the, and heat is passed, after the daily thunderstorm has come and gone, he'll have maybe three hours to go. All things being equal, he can get there before nightfall. He pours down, bounces off the concrete. He relaxes into it, breathes it in, feels the sweat trickling down, like millipedes walking on him. His eyes waver shut, the old films whir and crackle through his head. What the fuck did he need me for, he says. Why didn't he leave me alone? No point thinking about it, not in this heat, with his brain turning to melted cheese. Not melted cheese. Better to avoid food images. To putty, to glue, to hair product in cream form in a tube. He once used that. He can picture its exact position on the shelf, lined up next to his razor. He'd like neatness in a shelf. He has a sudden clear image of himself, freshly showered, running the cream product through his damp hair with his hands in paradise, waiting for Oryx. He'd meant well, or at least he hadn't meant ill. He'd never wanted to hurt anyone, not seriously, not in real space-time. Fantasies didn't count. It was Saturday. Jimmy was lying in bed. He was finding it hard to get up these days. He'd been late for work a couple of times in the past week, and added to the times before that and the times before that, it was going to be trouble for him soon. Not that he'd been out carousing, the reverse. He'd been avoiding human contact. The Anu Yu higher-ups hadn't chewed him out yet. Probably they knew about his mother and her traitor's death. Well, of course they did, though it was the kind of deep, dark, open secret that was never mentioned in the compound. Bad luck, evil eye, might be catching, best to act dumb, and so forth. Probably they were cutting him some slack. There was a good, uh, there was one good thing anyway. Maybe now they'd finally that they'd finally scratched his mother off the list. The corpsman would leave him alone. Get it up, get it up, get it up," said the voice clock. It was pink, phallus-shaped, a cock clock given to him as a joke by one of his lovers. He thought it was funny at the time, but this morning he found it insulting. That's all he was to her, to all of them, a mechanical joke. Nobody wanted to be sexless, but nobody wanted to be nothing but sex, Craig said once. Oh, yes, three, thought Jimmy, another human conundrum. What's the time, he said to the clock. It dipped its head, sproinged up right again. It's noon, it's noon, it's noon, it's shut up, said Jimmy. The clock wilted. It was programmed to respond to harsh tones. <laughs> Jimmy considered getting out of bed, going to the kitchen, opening a beer. That was a good idea. He'd had a late night. One of his lovers, the woman who'd given him the clock, in fact, had made her way through his wall of silence. She'd turned up around ten with some takeout, nubbins and fries. She knew what he liked, and a bottle of scotch. I've been concerned about you, she said. What she'd really wanted was a quick, furtive jab, so he'd done his best, and she'd had a fine time, but his heart wasn't in it, and that must have been obvious. Then they'd had to go through the, what's the matter, are you bored with me, I really care about you, and so forth, and blah, blah. Leave your husband, Jimmy had said, to cut her short. Let's run away to the plebe lands and live in a trailer park. Oh, I don't think, you don't mean that. What if I did? You know I care about you, but I care about him too, and from the waist down. Pardon? She was a genteel woman. She said pardon instead of what? I said from the waist down. That's how you really care about me. Want me to spell it out for you? I don't know what's got into you. You've become so mean lately. No fun at all? Well, actually, no. Then piss off. After that, they'd had a fight and she'd cried, which, strangely enough, had made Jimmy feel better. After that, they'd finished the scotch, and after that, they'd had more sex, and this time Jimmy had enjoyed himself, but his lover hadn't, because he'd been too rough and fast and had not said anything flattering to her the way he usually did. Great ass, and so on and so forth. He shouldn't have been so crabby. She was a fine woman with real tits and problems of her own. 
He wondered whether he'd ever see her again. Most likely he would, because she'd had that I can cure you look in your eyes, in her eyes when she had left. After Jimmy had taken a leak and was getting the beer out of the fridge, his intercom buzzed. There she was, right on cue. Immediately he felt surly again. He went over to the speakerphone. Go away, he said. It's Craig. I'm downstairs. I don't believe it, said Jimmy. He punched in the numbers for the video cam in the lobby. It was Craig, all right, giving him the finger and the grin. Let me in, said Craig. And Jimmy did, because right then, Craig was about the only person he wanted to see. Craig was much the same. He had the same dark clothing. He wasn't even balder. What the fuck are you doing here, said Jimmy. After the initial surge of pleasure, he felt embarrassed that he wasn't dressed yet and that his apartment was knee-deep in dust bunnies and cigarette butts and dirty glassware and empty nubbins containers, but Craig didn't seem to notice. Nice to feel, to feel I'm welcome, said Craig. Sorry, things haven't been too good lately, said Jimmy. Yeah, I saw that. Your mother. I emailed, but she didn't answer. I haven't been picking up my emails, said Jimmy. Understandable. It was on brain frizz, inciting to violence, memberships in a band organization, hampering the dissemination of commercial products, treasonable crimes against society. I guess that last was the demo she was in, throwing bricks or something. Too bad she was a nice lady. Neither nice nor lady was applicable to Jimmy's view, but he wasn't up to deba debating this, not so early in the day. Want a beer, he said. No, thanks, said Craig. I just came to see you, see if you were all right. I'm all right, said Jimmy. Craig looked at him. Let's go to the Plebelands, he said. Troll a few bars. This is a joke, right, said Jimmy. No, really, I've got the passes, my regular one and one for you by which Jimmy knew that Craig must uh, be somebody. He was impressed. Much more than that, he was touched that Craig, Craig would, uh, could experience concern for him, would come all this way to seek him out. Even though they hadn't been in close touch lately, Jimmy's fault, Craig was still his friend. Five hours later, they were strolling through the plebe lands north of New, New York. It had taken only a couple of hours to get there, bullet train to the nearest compound, and then an official core car with an armed driver, laid on by whoever was doing Craig's bidding. The car had taken them into the heart of what Craig called the action and dropped them off there. They'd be shadowed, though, said Craig. They'd be protected, so no harm could come to them. Before setting out, Craig had stuck a needle in Jimmy's arm, an all-purpose, short-term vaccine he'd cooked himself. The Plebelands, he said, were a giant Petri dish. A lot of guck and contagious plasma got spread around there. If you grew up surrounded by it, you were more or less immune, unless a new bioform came raging through. But if you were from the compounds and you set your f and set foot in the plebes, you were a beast. It was like having a big sign on your forehead that said, eat me. Craig had had nose cones for them, too, the latest model, not just to filter microbes, but also to skim out particulate. The air was worse than the plebelands, he said, more junk blowing in the wind, fewer whirlpool purifier purifying towers dotted around. Jimmy had never been to the Plebelands before. He'd only looked over the wall. He was excited to finally be there, though. He wasn't prepared for so many people so close to one another, walking, talking, hurrying somewhere. Spitting on the sidewalk was a feature he personally could skip. Rich Plebelanders in luxury cars, poor ones on solar bikes, hookers in fluorescent spandex or in short shorts, or more athletically showing off their firm thighs, on scooters, weaving in and out of traffic, all skin colors, all sizes. Not all prices, though, said Craig. This was the low end. So Jimmy could window shop, but he shouldn't purchase. He should save that for later. The plebe land inhabitants didn't look like the mental deficients the compounders were fond of depicting, or most of them didn't. After a while, Jimmy began to relax, enjoy the experience. There was so much to see, so much being hawked, so much being offered. Neon slogans, billboards, ads everywhere, and there were real tramps, real beggar women, just as in old DVD musicals. Jimmy kept expecting them to kick up their battered boot soles, break into song. Real musicians on the street corners, real bands of street urchins, asymmetries, deformities, the faces were a far cry from the regularity of the compounds. There were even bad teeth. He was gawking. Watch your wallet, said Craig, not that you'll need cash. Why not? My treat, said Craig. I can't let you do that. Your turn next time. Fair enough, said Jimmy. Here we are. This is what they call the street of dreams. The shops here were mid to high end. The displays elaborate. Blue jeans day, Jimmy read. Try snip and fix. 
Hera disease is removed. Why be short? Go Goliath. Dream kidlets. Heal your helix. Crib filler, filler is limited. Weenie weenie. Longfellow's the fellow. So this is where our stuff turns to gold, said Crake. Our stuff? What we're doing out at Rejuve, us and the other body-oriented compounds. Does all of it work? Jimmy was impressed. Not so much by the promises as by the slogans. Minds like his is passed this way. His dank mood of the morning had vanished. He was feeling quite cheerful. There was so much coming at him, so much information. It took up all of his headroom. Quite a lot of it, said Craig. Of course, nothing's perfect. But the competition's ferocious, especially what the Russians are doing, and the Japanese, and the Germans, of course, and the Swedes. We're holding our own, though. We have a reputation for dependable product. People come here for all over the world. They shop around. Gender, sexual orientation, height, color of skin and eyes, it's all on order. It can all be done or redone. You have no idea how much money changes hands on this one street alone. Let's get a drink, said Jimmy. He was thinking about his hypothetical brother, the one that wasn't born yet. Was this where his father and Ramona had gone shopping? They had a drink and then something to eat. Real oysters, said Craig. Real Japanese beef, rare as diamonds. It must have cost a fortune. And then they went to a couple of other places and ended up in a bar featuring oral sex on trapezes. And Jimmy drank something orange that glowed in the dark and then a couple more of the same. And then he was telling the Craig the story of his life, no, the story of his mother's life, in one long garbled sentence like a string of chewing gum that just keeps coming out of his mouth. Then they were somewhere else on an endless green satin bed being worked over by two girls covered from head to toe in sequins that were glued on their skin and shimmered like the scales of a virtual fish. Jimmy had never known a girl who could twist and twine to such advantage. Was it there or at one of the bars earlier that the subject of the job had come up? The next morning he couldn't remember. Craig had said, job, you, rejuve, and Jimmy had said, doing what, cleaning the toilets? And Craig had laughed and said, better than that. Jimmy couldn't remember saying yes, but he must have. He would have taken any job no matter what it was. He wanted to move, move on. He was ready for a whole new chapter. Bliss Plus. On the Monday morning after the weekend with Craig, Jimmy turned up at a new U for another day of word-mongering. He felt pretty wasted, but hope it didn't show, though it encouraged all kinds of chemical experience by its paying clientele. A new U frowned upon anything similar amongst the hired help. It figured, Jimmy thought, in the olden days, bootleggers had seldom been drunks, or so he'd read. Before going to his desk, he visited the men's, checked himself in the mirror. He looked like a regurgitated pizza. Plus, he was late, but for once, nobody noticed. All of a sudden, there was his boss and some other functionaries so elevated that Jimmy had never seen them before. Jimmy's hand was being shaken, his back gently slapped, a glass of champagne look-alike pressed into his hand. Oh, good, hair of the dog, glug, 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 went Jimmy's voice balloon, and he took care to merely sip. And then he was being told what a pleasure it had been to have him with a new you and what an asset he'd proved to be and how many warm wishes would accompany him when he was uh, where he was going. And, by the way, many, many congratulations. His severance package would be deposited immediately in his core bank account. It would be a generous one, more generous than his length of service, warranted because, let's be frank, his friends at a new you wanted Jimmy to remember them in a positive manner in his terrific new position. Whatever that may be, thought Jimmy, as he sat in a sealed bullet train. The train had been arranged for him, and so had the, uh, had the move. A team would arrive. They'd pack everything. They were professionals, never fear. He barely had time to contact his various lovers, and when he did, he discovered that each one of them had already been discreetly informed by Craig personally, who, it appeared, had long tentacles. How had he known about them? Maybe he'd been hacking into Jimmy's email. Easy for him, but why bother? I'll miss you, Je uh, Jimmy, said an e-message from one. Oh, Jimmy, you are so funny, said another. Were was a creep out. It, was as if, as if he had, it wasn't as if he had died or anything. Jimmy spent his first night in rejuvenescence at the VIP guest hotel. He poured himself a drink from the mini bar, straight scotch, as real as it came, and then spent the whole a while looking at a picture window at the view. Not that he could make out very much except lights, 
he could see the Paradise Dome, an immense half circle in the distance, floodlit from below, but he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a skating rink. <laughs> Next morning, Craig took him for a preliminary tour of the reju rejuvenescence compound in his souped-up electric golf cart. It was, Jimmy had to admit, spectacular in all ways. Everything was sparkling clean, landscaped, ecologically pristine, and very expensive. The air was particulate-free due to the many solar whirlpool purifying towers discreetly placed and disguised as modern art. Rockulators took care of the microclimate. Butterflies as big as plates drifted among the vividly colored shrubs. It made all the other compounds Jimmy had ever been in, walks and crick included, look shabby and retro. Who, or I'm sorry, what pays for all this, he asked Craig as they passed the state-of-the-art luxuries mall. Marble everywhere, colonnades, cafes, ferns, takeout booths, roller skating paths, juice bars, a self-energizing gym where running on the treadmill kept the light bulbs going. Roman looked fountains with nymphs and sea gods. Grief in the face of inevitable death, said Craig, the wish to stop time, the human condition. Which was not very informative, said Jimmy. You'll see, said Craig. They had lunch at one of the five-star rejuve restaurants on an air-conditioning pseudo-balcony overlooking the main compound organic botan bot bot mix greenhouse. Craig had a, the conga lamb, a new Australian slice, I'm sorry. Cake had, Craig had the kanga lamb. <laughs> a new Australian splice that combined the placid character and high protein yield of the sheep with the kangaroo's resistance to disease and absence of methane-producing, ozone-destroying flatulence. Jimmy ordered the raisin stuffed capon, real free-range capon, real sun-dried raisins, Craig assured him. Jimmy was so used to chicky knobs by now, to their bland tofu-like consistency and their inoffensive flavor that the capon tasted quite wild. My unit's called Paradise, said Craig, over the soy banana flambe. What we're working on is immortality. So is everyone else, said Jimmy. They've kind of done, in, done it in rats. Kind of is crucial, said Craig. What about the cryogenics guys, said Jimmy? Freeze your head. Get your body reconstituted once they've figured out how. They're doing a brisk business. Their stock's high. Sure, and a couple of years later, they toss you out the back door and tell your relatives there was a power failure. Anyway, we're cutting out the deep freeze. How do you mean? With us, said Craig, you wouldn't have to die first. You've really done it. Not yet, said Craig, but think of the R&D budget. Millions? Mega millions, said Craig. Can I have another drink, said Jimmy? Th this was a lot to take in. No, I need you to listen. I can listen and drink, too. Not very well. Try me, said Jimmy. Within Paradise, said Craig, and they'd visit the facility after lunch, there were two major initiatives going forward. The first, the Bliss Plus pill, was a prophylactic in nature, and the logic behind it was simple. Eliminate the external causes of death, and you were halfway there. External causes, said Jimmy. War, which is to say misplaced sexual energy, which we consider to be a larger factor than the economic, racial, and religious causes often cited. Contagious diseases, especially sexually transmitted ones, overpopulation, leading, as we've seen in spades, to environmental degradation and poor nutrition. Jimmy said it sounded like a tall order. So much had been tried in those areas, so much had failed. Craig smiled. If at first you don't succeed, read the instructions, he said. Meaning, the proper study of mankind is man. Meaning, you've got to work with what's on the table. The Bliss Plus pill was designed to take a set of givens, namely the nature of human nature, and steer these givens in a more beneficial direction than the ones hitherto taken. It was based on studies of the now unfortunately extinct pig, pygmy or bonobo chimpanzee, a close relative of Homo sapiens sapiens. Unlike the latter species, the bonobo had been partially monogamous with polygamous and polyandrous tendencies. Instead, it had been in indiscriminately promiscuous, had not pair bonded, and had spent most of its waking life when it wasn't eating, engaged in copulation. Its intraspecific aggression factor had been very low, which had led to the concept of Bliss Plus. The aim was to produce, to produce a single pill that at one time and at the same time, A, would protect, protect the user against all known sexually transmitted disease, diseases, fatal, inconvenient, or merely unsightly. 
B would provide an unlimited supply of libido and sexual prowess. Coupled with a generalized sense of energy and well-being, thus reducing the frustration and blocked testosterone that led to jealousy and violence and eliminating feelings of low self-worth. C would prolong youth. These three capabilities would be the selling points, said Craig, but there would be a fourth which would not be advertised. The Bliss Plus pill would also act as a surefire, one-time does-it-all birth control pill for male and female alike thus automatically lowering the population level. This effect could be made reversible, though not in individual subjects, by altering the components of the pill as needed, i.e. if the populations of any one area got too low. So basically, you're going to sterilize people without them knowing it under the guise of giving them the ultra in orgies. That's a crude way of putting it, said Craig. Such a pill, he said, would confer large-scale benefits not only on individual users, although it had to appeal to these or it would be a failure in the marketplace, but on society as a whole, and not only on society, but on the planet. The investors were very keen on it. It was going to be global. It was all upside. There was no downside at all. He, Craig, was very excited about it. I didn't know you were so altruistic, said Jimmy. Since when had Craig been a cheerleader for the human race? It's not altruism exactly, said Craig. More like sink or swim. I've seen the latest confidential core demographic report. As a species, we're in deep trouble, worse than anyone's saying. They're afraid to release the stats because people might just give up, but take it from me. We're running out of space time. Demand for resources has exceeded supply for decades in marginal geopolitical areas, hence the famines and droughts, but very soon demand is going to exceed supply for everyone. With, bliss plus, with the bis, Bliss Plus pill, the human race will have a better chance of swimming. How do you figure, maybe Jimmy shouldn't have said, had that extra drink. He was getting a bit confused. Fewer people, therefore more to go around. What if the fewer people are very greedy and wasteful, said Jimmy. That's not out of the question. They won't be, said Craig. You've got this thing now, said Jimmy. He was beginning to see the possibilities, endless high-grade sex, no consequences. Come to think of it, his own libido could use a little toning up. Does it make your hair grow back? He almost said, where, where can I get some, but stopped himself in time. It was an elegant concept, said Craig, though it still needed some tweaking. They hadn't got it to work seamlessly yet, not on all fronts. It was still in the clinical trial stage. A couple of the test subjects had literally fucked themselves to death. Several had assaulted old ladies and household pets, and there had been a few unfortunate cases of uh, priapism and split dicks. Also, at first, the sexually transmitted disease protection mechanism had failed in a spectacular manner. One subject had grown a big genital wart all over her epidermis, stressing, distressing to observe, but they'd taken care of that with lasers and exfoliation, at least temporarily. In short, there had been errors, false directions taken, but there were, they were getting close, uh, very close to a solution. Needless to say, Craig continued, the thing would become a huge money spinner. It would be the must-have pill in every country and every society of the world. Of course, the crank religions wouldn't like it in view of the fact that their raison d'etre was based on misery indefinitely deferred gratification and sexual frustration, but they wouldn't be able to hold out long. The tide of human desire, the desire for more and better, would overwhelm them. It would take control of the drive uh, and drive events as it had in every large change throughout history. Jimmy uh, said the thing sounded interesting, provided its shortcoming could be remedied, that is. Good name, too, Bliss Plus. A whispering, seductive sound. He liked it. He had no further wish to try it out himself, however. He had enough problems with it without his penis bursting. Where do you get the subjects, he said, for the clinical trials? Craig grinned. From the poorer countries. Pay them a few dollars. They don't even know what they're taking. Sex clinics, of course. They're happy to help. Poor houses, prisons, and from the ranks of the desperate, as usual. Where do I fit in? You'll do the ad campaign, said Craig. Mad Adam. After lunch, they went to Paradise. The dome complex was at the far right side of the rejuve compound. It had its own park around it, a dense climate-controlled plantation of mixed tropical slices, 
above which it rose like a blind eyeball. There was a security installation around the park, very tight, said Craig. Even the corpsmen were not allowed inside. Paradise had been his concept, and he'd made that a condition when he'd agreed to actualize it. He didn't want a lot of heavy-handed ignoramuses poking into things they couldn't understand. Craig's pass was good for both of them, of course. They rolled in through the first gate and along the roadway through the trees, and then there was another checkpoint with guards, paradise uniforms, Craig explained, not corpse. Uh, they seemed to materialize from the bushes and then more trees, and then the curved wall of the bubble dome itself. It might look delicate, said Craig, but it was made of new muscle adhesion, silicone, dendrite formation alloy, ultra-resistant. You'd have to have some very advanced tools and c to cut through it, as it would reconform itself after pressure and automatically repair any gashes. Moreover, it had the capacity to both filter and breathe, like an eggshell, so it required a solar-generated current to do so. They turned the golf cart over to one of the guards and were coated through the outer door, which closed with a woof behind them. Why did it make that sound, said Jimmy nervously. It's an airlock, said Craig, as in spaceships. What for? In case the place ever has to be sealed off, said Craig. Hostile bioforms, toxin attacks, fanatics, the usual. By this time, Jimmy was feeling a little strange. Craig hadn't really told him what went on in here, not in specific detail. Wait and see, was all he said. Once they were through the inner door, they were in a familiar enough complex, halls, doors, staff with digital clipboards, others hunched in front of screens. It was like organing farms. It was like Healthwiser. It was like Watson Crick, only newer. But physical plants were just a shell, said Craig. What really counted in a research facility was the quality of the brains. These are top of the line, he said nodding left and right. In return, there was a lot of deferential smiling, and this wasn't faked, a lot of awe. Jimmy had never been clear about Craig's exact position, but whatever his nominal title, he'd been vague about it. He was obviously the biggest ant in the ant hill. Each of the staff had a name tag with block lettering, one or two words only, black rhino, white sedge, ivory-billed woodpecker, polar bear, Indian tiger, lotus blue, swift fox, the names, he said to Craig, you rated Extinctathon. It's more than the names, said Craig. These people are Extinctathon. They're all grandmasters. What you're looking at is Matt Adams, the cream of the crop. You're choking. How come they're here, said Jimmy. They're the splice geniuses, said Craig. The ones that were pulling off those capers, the asphalt eating microbes, the outbreak of neon colored herpes simplex on the west coast, the chicky dom wasps, and so on. Neon herpes. I didn't hear about that, said Jimmy. Pretty funny. How did you track them down? I wasn't the only person after them. They were making themselves very unpopular in some quarters. I just got to them ahead of the core, that's all. Or I got most of them, anyways. Jimmy was going to ask what happened to the others, but he thought better of it. So you kidnapped them, or what? That wouldn't have surprised Jimmy, brain snatching being a customary practice though usually the brains were snatched between countries, not within them. I merely persuaded them they'd be a lot happier and safer in here than out there. Safer in core territory? I got them secure papers. Most of them agreed with me, especially when I offered to destroy their so-called real identities and all records of their previous existences. I thought those guys were anti-compound, said Jimmy. The stuff Matt Adam was doing was pretty hostile from what you showed me. They were anti-compounds, still are probably, but after the Second World War in the 20th centuries, the Allies invited a lot of German rocket scientists to come and work with them, and I don't recall anyone saying no. When your main game's over, you can always move your chessboard elsewhere. What if they try sabotage or escape? Yeah, said Craig. A couple were like that at the beginning, not team players. Thought they'd take what they'd done here, cart it offshore, go underground, or set up elsewhere. What did you do? They fell off Cleveland overpasses, said Craig. Is that a joke? In a manner of speaking, you'll need another name, Craig said, a Matt Adam name so you'll fit in. I thought since I'm Craig here, you could go back to being sick me, that, the way you were when we were, how old? Fourteen. Those were definitive times, said Craig. Jimmy wanted to linger, but Craig was already hurrying him along. He'd have liked to have talked with some of the people, hear their stories, had any of them known his mother, for instance, but maybe he could do that later. On the other hand, maybe not. 
He'd been seen with Crake, the alpha wolf, the silverback gorilla, the head lion. Nobody would want to get too cozy with him. They'd see uh, his as the jackal position. Paradise. They dropped in at Crake's office so Jimmy could get a little oriented, said Crake. It was a large space with many gizmos in it, as Jimmy would have expected. There was a painting on the wall, an eggplant, and an orange plate. It was the first picture Jimmy ever remembered seeing in a place of Crake's. He thought of asking if that was Crake's girlfriend, but thought better of it. He zeroed in on the mini bar. Anything in that? Later, said Craig. Craig still had a collection of fridge magnets, but they were different ones. No more science quips. Where God is, man is not. There are two moons, the one you can see and the one you can't. Du muss dein Leben andern. We understand more than we know. I think, therefore, to stay human is to break limitation. Dream steals from its lair towards its prey. What are you really up to here, said Jimmy. Craig grinned. What is really? Bogus, said Jimmy. But he was thrown off balance. Now, said Craig, it was time to get serious. He was going to show Jimmy the other thing they were doing, the main thing here at Paradise. What Jimmy was about what, to see was, well, it couldn't be described. It was, quite simply, Craig's, Craig's life work. Jimmy put on a suitably solemn face. What next? Some gruesome new food stub substance, no doubt. A liver tree, a sausage vine, or some sort of zucchini that grew wool. He braced himself. Craig led Jimmy along and around. Then they were standing in front of a large picture window. No, a one-way mirror. Jimmy looked in. There was a large central space filled with trees and plants, and above them a blue sky. Not really a blue sky, only the curved ceiling of the bubble dome, with a clever projection device that simulated dawn, sunlight, evening, night. There was a fake moon that went through its phases, he discovered later. There was fake rain. This was his first view of the Crakers. They were naked, but not like the nudie news. There was no self-consciousness, none at all. At first, he couldn't believe them. They were so beautiful. Black, yellow, white, brown, all available skin colors. Each individual was exquisite. Are they robots or what, he said. You know, how they've got floor models and furniture stores, said Craig. Yeah, these are the floor models. It was the result of a logical chain of progression, said Craig, that evening over drinks in the Paradise Lounge. Fake palm trees, canned music, real Campari, real soda. One of the proteonome had been fully analyzed, and interspecies gene and part gene splicing were thoroughly underway. The Paradise Project, or something like it, had only been a matter of time. What Jimmy had seen was the next-to-end result of seven years of intensive trial and error research. At first, said Craig, we had to alter ordinary human embryos, which we got from... Never mind where we got them. But these people are sui generis. They're reproducing themselves now. They look more like seven-year-olds, said Jimmy. Craig explained about the rapid growth factors he's incorporated. Also, he said, they're programmed to drop dead at age 30, suddenly, without getting sick. No old age, none of these anxieties, they'll just keel over. Not that they know it, none of them has died yet. I thought you were working on immortality. Immortality, said Craig, is a concept. If you take mortality as being not death, but the foreknowledge of it and the fear of it, then immortality is the absence of such fear. Babies are immortal. Edit out the fear and you'll be... Sounds like applied rhetoric 101, said Jimmy. What? Never mind, Martha Graham stuff. Oh, right. Other compounds in other countries were following similar lines of reasoning, said Craig. They were developing their own prototypes, so the population in the bubble dome was ultra-secret. Vow of silence, closed-circuit internal emailing only unless you had special permission. Living quarters inside the security zone but outside the airlock. This would reduce the chances of infection in, a, in case any of the staff got sick. The Paradise models had enhanced immune system functions. So the probability of contagious diseases spreading among them was low. Nobody was allowed out of the complex, or almost nobody. Craig could go out, of course. He was the liaison between Paradise and the rejuve top brass. Though he hadn't let them in yet, he was making them wait. They were a greedy bunch, nervous about their investment. They'd wanted to jump the gun and start marketing too soon. Also, they'd talk too much, tip off the competition. They were all boasters, those guys. So now that I'm in here, I can never get out, said Jimmy. You didn't tell me that. 
You'll be an exception, said Craig. Nobody gonna kidnap you for what's inside your skull. You're just doing the ads, remember? But the rest of the team, he said, the mad Adamite contingent was confined to base for the duration. The duration? Until we go public, said Craig. Very soon, Rejuvenescence hoped to hit the market with the various blends on offer. They'd be able to create totally chosen babies that would incorporate any feature, physical or mental or spiritual, that the buyer might wish to select. The present methods on offer were very hit or miss, said Craig. Certain hereditary diseases could be screened out, true, but apart from that, there was a lot of spoilage, a lot of waste. The customers never knew whether they'd get exactly what they paid for, in addition to which there were too many unintended consequences. But with the Paradise Method, there would be a 99% accuracy. Whole populations could be created that would have pre-selected characteristics. Beauty, of course, that would be in high demand, and docility. Several world leaders had expressed interest in that. Paradise had already developed a UV-resistant skin, a built-in insect repellent, an unprecedented ability to digest unrefined plant material. As for immunity from microbes, what had uh, until now been done with drugs would soon be innate. Compared to the Paradise Project, even the Bliss Plus pill was a crude tool, although it would be a lucrative interim solution. In the long run, however, the benefits for the future human race of the two combinations would be stupendous. They would be inextricably linked. Um, the pill and the product. The pill would put a stop to haphazard reproduction. The product would replace it with a superior method. They were in two stages of a single plan, you might say. It was amazing, said Craig, what once unimaginable things had been accomplished by the team here. What had been altered was nothing less than the ancient primate brain. Gone were its destructive features, the features responsible for the world's current illnesses. For instance, racism or as they referred to it in paradise, pseudo-speciation, had been eliminated in the model group merely by switching the bonding mechanism. The paradise people simply did not register skin color. Hierarchy could not ex exist among them because they lacked the neural complexes that would have created it. Since they were neither hunters nor agriculturalist, um, uh, agriculturalist hungry for land, there was no, ter no territoriality the king of the castle, hard wiring that had plagued humanity, had, in them, been unwired. They ate nothing but leaves and grass and roots and a berry or two. Thus their foods were plentiful and always available. Their sexuality was not a constant torment to them, not a cloud of turbulent hormones. They came into heat at regular intervals, as did most mammals other than man. In fact, as there would never be anything for these people to inherit, there would be no family trees, no marriages, and no divorces. They were perfectly adjusted to their habitats, so they would never have to create houses or tools or weapons or, for that matter, clothing. They would have no need to invent any harmful symbolisms such as kingdoms, icons, gods, or money. Best of all, they recycled their own excrement by means of a brilliant splice, incorporating genetic material from, excuse me, said Jimmy, but a lot of this stuff isn't what the average parent is looking for in a baby. Didn't she get a bit carried away? I told you, said Craig patiently, these are the floor models. They represent the art of the possible. We can list the individual features for prospective buyers and then we can customize. Not everyone will want all the bells and whistles, we know that. Though you'd be surprised at how many people would like a very beautiful, smart baby that eats nothing but grass. The vegans are highly interested in that little item. We've done our market research. Oh good, thought Jimmy, your baby can double as a lawnmower. Can they speak, he asked. Of course they speak, said Craig, when they have something they want to say. Do they make jokes? Not as such, said Craig. For jokes you need a certain edge, a little malice. It took a lot of trial and error, and we're still testing, but we think we've managed to do away with jokes. He raised his glass, grinned at Jimmy. Glad you're here, Corknut, he said. I needed somebody I could talk to. Jimmy was given his own suite inside the Paradise Dome. His belongings were there before him, each one tidied away, just where it ought to be. Underwear in the underwear drawer, shirts neatly stacked, electric toothbrush plugged in and recharged it. Except that there were more of these belongings than he remembered possessing. More shirts, more underwear, more electric toothbrushes. The air conditioning was set at a temperature that he liked, and a tasty snack, melon prosciutto, a French brie with a label that appeared authentic was set out on the dining room table. The dining room table, 
He'd never had a dining room table before.